So my name is Michael Schulz. I work at the Technical University of Munich, and it's my pleasure to moderate today this webinar on behalf of the Lens Working Group 3, uh, Priority Action Number 4, which is a team of, of scientists uh, from ILL, PSI, and FRM2 who have joined forces on the topic of development of novel instrumentation for high resolution imaging, mainly on lithium ion batteries. And I see Marcus Strobel and Lukas Helfen, my colleagues from PA4, are now also here. So um, we are happy to announce our today's speaker, Daniel Hasse, in this Lens webinar about new directions in instrumentation. Uh, Dan is one of the people, I have known him for, for a long time, and he's one of the people in the neutron imaging community whom I personally associate very much with uh, the term novel in, uh, instrumentation. So uh, to be a bit more specific, uh, Dan is, a, is working as a scientist at the National Insti Institute of Standards and Technology, the NIST in, in the US in Gaithersburg. Uh, and he leads a team of uh, scientists in the development of, of novel in imaging and uh, optics techniques for material science applications. Um, when I met Dan or since I met Dan many years ago, he has always been the source of many novel and sometimes very ambitious ideas and concepts for neutron imaging instrumentation. Uh, and usually the main driver behind most of these developments was to improve the achievable spatial resolution, uh, in particular in order to study uh, water management in operating fuel cells. But of course also other things were done at NIST by, in the group of them. Uh, especially this includes the development of, of novel detectors uh, such as microchannel plates, but also completely new imaging methods. Uh, for example, the Walter Optics microscope, which is basically the analog to a Hooks microscope in, in neutron imaging. Uh, and I bet uh, we will hear a few more details about this in the dance today's presentation. And another very remarkable project of Dan is, and his collaborators is the development of a far field neutron grating interferometer, which allows to extend the achievable length scales in neutron imaging uh, below the spatial resolution of neutron imaging by using reciprocal space uh, and the neutron scattering techniques. But with that, I think we, I have already taken enough of your, of your time and I would like to give the word to Dan and I ask you to kindly please share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you, Michael, for the very kind introduction. Um, I have to say uh, our imaging community is both small and supportive uh, and uh, it's, it's been great fun to work uh, in neutron imaging with all of the good collaborators and colleagues uh, around the world. Um, so, uh, I'm going to talk about Walter Optics Space Neutron Microscope. Um, and so, as Michael indicated, uh, one of the goals in neutron imaging is sort of a, a limbo, as you will. Uh, so, how low can you go? How small of a feature can, can you resolve? Uh, and I'll go briefly over uh, this sort of little timeline that we've had realized at NIST. Um, I'm ignoring here, obviously, all of the work that's gone on in other institutes, um, but uh, I'm just focused on my own work here. Uh, and so I ap apologies to all of the good work that's gone on elsewhere. Just give the uh, uh, first credit to my colleagues at NIST who um, have made much of the work here possible. Um, David Jacobson uh, it was my mentor as my, for my postdoc, uh, and he and I have continued to work together very closely. Uh, Eli Baltic is a technician in our group, um, has been there uh, since 2006 or so. Uh, Jacob Lamana joined us as a National Research Council uh, postdoc in um, 2014 uh, and has since become a full-time staff member. Um, I'm going to talk about his uh, primary work uh, developing our simultaneous neutron and x-ray tomography system. Um, a recent postdoc, Victoria De Stefano, um, uh, left us very briefly, it was only with us briefly before she went off into a more uh, policy, role, science policy role um, in the Office of Science at the Department of Energy. Um, and then we have two postdocs who have joined our group uh, very recently. So Cyrus Doherty um, is an electrochemist who did his PhD work 
uh, in vanadium redox batteries, and he joined us to work on um, our simultaneous neutron X-ray tomography uh, of lithium ion batteries. Um, and then uh, Young Ju Kim, who was a PhD student of uh, Professor Sung Wook Lee uh, in uh, uh, Pusan National University, uh, joined us to work uh, on our dark field imaging project um, that Michael referred to. Uh, I will not be talking about the, the dark field project here, uh, just to keep things more focused on Next and Walter Optics. So as Michael said, um, I'm from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, um, or NIST. Uh, NIST is the National Metrology Institute for the United States of America. So we um, maintain the weights of standards so that uh, US-based companies can sell their goods and services uh, to those in Europe and Asia and abroad through um, those agreements. Um, here is Washington, DC. We're about, uh, say, less than 20 kilometers um, north uh, west of the city. Uh, we have a nice campus uh, in, in Gaithersburg. It's about 500 acres, um, about 3,000 people. Uh, there are four Nobel laureates uh, in the physics lab, mostly for our uh, atomic clock work. We have other satellite campuses, uh, the larger one being in Boulder, Colorado, where most of the work on atomic clocks um, uh, goes on. And we have a lab uh, in, in Charleston, South Carolina, and a very small facility in, um, in Hawaii. Uh, so we were the first uh, national lab established in the United States in 1901 because the department of the, the um, leader of the Department of Commerce realized that he didn't know anything about setting weights and standards. And so uh, he established NIST so that we could do, have a, a more sound basis for doing those things. So at NIST, we have uh, a 20 megawatt um, fission research reactor. It was uh, licensed, first operated in 1967, uh, and we're currently um, licensed to run until 2029. Uh, we believe that we'll be able to do one more round of relicensing um, to, to 2049, uh, and there are already plans um, starting to figure out what happens um, after that. Uh, the current proposal is to build another 20 megawatt uh, reactor, but with a different core design. Um, there's a very robust uh, scattering program uh, and imaging program at the, at the NCNR. Um, and, you know, shown here is um, our instrument suite. Uh, mostly uh, there are something like five or six small angle neutron scattering uh, instruments um, with different resolutions. Uh, there's a couple of diffractometers, a few reflectometers, uh, and the focus of this talk are our two neutron imaging instruments, uh, the BT2 facility, which uh, is in the confinement building uh, and has a thermal neutron spectrum since it's looking directly at the core of the reactor. Uh, this is where we've placed all of our fuel cell uh, infrastructure for the time being, um, because we're making use of the high penetrating power of the thermal neutrons to get through uh, a lot of the metal and the thicker water sections that one will uh, encounter in fuel cells. Um, in in uh, 2015, we first established the cold neutron imaging instrument in the uh, quote unquote old guide hole of the NCNR. Uh, so this is viewing a straight uh, nickel 58 uh, coated guide, um, which looks at the, the cold source. Um, and we built that in, uh, as I said, late summer of 2015. Uh, with a focus on doing um, wavelength selective imaging for uh, Bragg edge and grading interferometry, um, and well, mainly for housing the uh, the Walter optics, um, which I'll discuss uh, in a little bit. When we talk about neutrons, there's always the, you know, we have to talk about X-rays at some level because most people come in contact with X-rays. One of the first things we have to point out as, or I feel I have to point out as a neutron scientist is that the one of the main differences is just the source intensities, uh, the, the, the variation. And so um, it's basically night and day when you compare a, you know, user, na national user facility neutron source compared to one of the modern synchrotron sources. Uh, so there's a billion times difference in uh, light flux coming from the sun versus the stars. And that's the same difference between a synchrotron source and a neutron source. So it's, it's literally night and day when you're talking about source intensities. 
However, we can exploit the fact that neutrons interact uh, primarily with the nucleus rather than the electron cloud. Uh, and so we have a different set of um, contrasts that are possible uh, than you would have with uh, photons or for electrons, which are interacting with the electron cloud. And so this is just shown looking at this pair of Asiatic lilies inside a one inch thick or a two and a half centimeter thick uh, lead cask. Uh, and so the lead is obviously a neutron window, whereas the uh, water content in the leaves of the lily uh, block the neutron beams. And so we have good um, sensitivity to, to small amounts of water. Uh, but what's really powerful is if you can actually combine the X-ray and the neutron modes together uh, to get a more complete view of a complex system. Uh, this is not a complex system. This is just a hot wheel car. Uh, and so what we're showing here is the what we really see easily with the x-rays and what we really see easily with the neutrons. And so you see with the x-ray, it's just the metal shell uh, and the axles. Uh, and then most of the car interior with the plastics and the rubber we're seeing with the, the neutron mode. Um, and so we, what we want to do is not merely just overlay, but we want to tease the part um, uh, these complex samples. So <clears throat> the uh, instrument that um, we've built at NIST uh, is pretty simple. It was mainly a proof of concept uh, instrument. So it was just a, a micro, uh, an ultra bright uh, micro focus source from Oxford. So maximum voltage of 90 kilo electron volts, uh, spot size of something like 20 microns. Um, and the X-ray beam is going perpendicular to the neutron beam and the sample sits there in the center. Uh, we place a, a lithiated plastic in front of the um, X-ray detector to block the neutron beam. Uh, that might be scattered from the sample. And then in front of the neutron camera, we place a thin sheet of lead, something like five millimeters, and that blocks any uh, X-ray interaction with the simulators. Um, and shown here, sorry that this movie isn't playing, um, is a, we're looking at a shale sample in this case. Um, so uh, this is the output of the two modes, um, red being uh, the, the neutron. So we're seeing here the um, hydrogenous phases or the oil bearing phases in the shale. And the green is uh, the mineral content coming from the x-ray. And so really we're only seeing two, well you could say three regions of, uh, of the shale where the empty space is now just sort of the clay area that doesn't contain anything of interest. Um, but now if we're able to, instead of just you doing this independent um, segmentation, but use both modes, uh, as part of this, the segmentation process, we're picking up four additional uh, material faces within the, the shale. Uh, and so we're able to have a better understanding of the composition of our materials. And the way that we do that is um, first we do um, an automated uh, iterative um, <clears throat> volume registration. So we're doing rigid body transformations in terms of uh, translation, rotation, and scaling of the, the two X, two volumes, one from the X-ray and one from the neutron. Uh, and then using the Mattis Mutual Information Statistic, uh, we, we, we maximize that to improve the registration. And that's all done as a, a MATLAB function call. So they, MATLAB has that built in, uh, so that doesn't require any computing effort on my part to do the uh, registration. I, and then once these volumes are perfectly uh, aligned uh, in digitally, you can then compute the bivariate histogram. So we're showing here, sorry, a little slow on my computer, uh, the X-ray attenuation coefficient uh, versus the neutron attenuation coefficient. Uh, and so then just the counts in each voxel uh, to, to map out that, that histogram. And then by doing uh, simple hand-drawn polygons on this bivariate histogram, um, we can create labeled segmented data. Um, and so shown here, are just four of those um, regions uh, with their labels, uh, and then the output from one of the slices from the tomography. Um, and then using this just sort of binary output, we can then look at the structure of this uh, battery, which was um, uh, taken over uh, three different data sets and then stitched together. Uh, so this uh, works pretty well, even when you have very large um, volumes to work with. Uh, and so, the, the beauty of this is that it's these hand-drawn polygons can be done, you know, the segmentation process is done rather quickly. Uh, so this um, cement paste uh, was segmented in uh, pure 10, you know, 10 minutes of actual effort. 
Uh, and so that's um, pretty good because usually these segmentation problems can take grad students, uh, you know, 10 days or 10 weeks or, you know, hopefully not 10 years, but it can take a while to do these, these labelings. Um, and so because of this uh, unique power of the next system, um, we were able to get a project from um, the Army in collaboration with a, a local university at the University of Maryland to look at uh, lithium ion batteries. And so that's how uh, we've recruited Cyrus uh, to work with us to um, improve our um, throughput and uh, improve the quality of our uh, software and uh, tools, et cetera. Um, and just to, to emphasize that uh, we really think this um, simultaneous uh, uh, system is, is an important feature uh, and it really encourage other folks in the community to use this. It's become quite popular. Uh, so it first came live in uh, 2016. Um, and so as uh, time has gone on, it has become a larger, a more heavily demanded uh, uh, feature of the instrument uh, and actually overwhelms our uh, user obligation. So it's, it, it itself uh, is an oversubscribed um, device. So um, moving now to more spatial resolution and uh, the Walter optics. Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the BT2 has a lot of fuel cell infrastructure. And so the imaging program at uh, NIST started primarily to study fuel cells. Um, we uh, received um, a lot of support from General Motors and the Department of Energy uh, to establish a fuel cell, a neutron imaging of fuel cell uh, facility. Um, it has consumed, you know, at times more than 75% of our beam time. Um, and so it's been our, our uh, fairly strong focus. So uh, I have a lot of images of fuel cells. And so uh, a fuel cell is composed of um, uh, the magic part is this proton exchange membrane, um, which is basically a, when it's wet, is a solid acid. So protons can go through, but it is a gas barrier to hydrogen, so H2 or O2. Um, the <clears throat> protons uh, then interact uh, with uh, oxygen from air uh, at a catalyst particle, <coughs> excuse me, um, to form water. Uh, and then that water needs to escape out through the cathode side uh, through a gas diffusion layer, which is basically a porous carbon paper, um, and then out through the gas channels. You need humidity in order for the proton exchange membrane to be a good proton conductor. Um, but you don't want water anywhere else within the fuel cell because it impedes the access to the reaction sites. So you have a, a delicate balance where you want one part, which is a, a rather thin section, to be wet and then everywhere else to be dry. And so it's a difficult challenge to, to do this and to do it uh, both cheaply uh, in a way that uh, um, improves performance uh, and also doesn't uh, also has a long lifetime of the the device. So the proton exchange membrane is something like twenty to uh, twenty microns at most. The catalyst layer here is you know one to, to ten microns, uh, and the gas diffusion layer, this porous carbon, is something like two hundred fifty microns. When I started at NIST, uh, our best spatial resolution uh, was 250 microns because we were using um, uh, lithium fluoride and zinc sulfide scintillator screens. Um, in 2004, we uh, brought into service an amorphous silicon detector, uh, which allowed us to take real-time video. So we were able to do something like 30 Hertz frame rates, uh, which enabled us to capture uh, real-time movies of the water uh, transport in a fuel cell, looking at basically the channel versus land uh, architecture. So we weren't looking uh, at, at, in this, we weren't looking in the plane this way, but rather shooting through this way. So we were getting sort of an overall uh, water content. Um, in uh, 2006, uh, we brought into service the, our first uh, micro channel plate. Uh, this XDL is the kind of uh, readout. Uh, I'll show that it's sort of very cartoonish next. Um, and that enabled us now to look at the, the through plane water content, as I call it. Um, and then subsequently in uh, 2017, um, we realized that we could uh, uh, do this, the same centroiding that's done in the micro channel plates, but using um, simulator materials. Uh, and so we were able to have even higher spatial resolutions, I'll show. Um, 
as has been shown at, at Paul Shearer Institute, if you use thin um, Gaddox scintillator screens, you can also just improve your spatial resolution um, so long as you have a uh, fine enough pixel pitch to actually resolve that improvement in spatial resolution. Uh, and so I'll show you how we do that. Uh, and then ultimately what we want to do is Walter optics um, because doing high spatial resolution neutron imaging uh, is painful because of the time it requires. So first, uh, let me talk very briefly about uh, micro channel plates. Um, so if you're familiar with photomultiplier tubes, um, a micro channel plate is basically millions of photomultiplier tubes, but very, very small in diameter. So the diameter of the channel here is something like five microns. Uh, and then they're on, you know, some center of, uh, you know, about six or eight microns. Um, the wall material is loaded with a neutron absorber, either boron or gadolinium or, and or. Um, and then when the absorb, neutron absorber absorbs a neutron and you have your uh, charged particles that come off from it, uh, when the charged particles enter the channel, they spew out electrons into the channel. Um, a few kilovolt field uh, accelerates the electrons down the channel uh, and then creates a, a charge cascade. Um, at the exit of the microchannel plate, you have a charge cloud, which is on the order of some millimeters, uh, and that has been resolved by a position sensitive anode um, in the case of the, the detectors at NIST. Um, the limits here are that this is an event counting uh, detector, and so you have to be able, you have to have very fast electronics uh, to be able to count all of the, the neutrons that come up. Uh, and so if you have too high of affluence rates or too large of a field of view, you can overwhelm your detector and you have uh, pretty serious dead time effects that occur. Um, with uh, the evolving um, Metapix uh, uh, chips that are coming out from um, uh, CERN, um, it's possible that this uh, event rate is going to uh, improve uh, quite a lot. Uh, which will allow reasonable fields of view. Um, and I think with these new uh, Metapix arc detecture, um, it will be an important uh, detector for the imaging suite, you know, imaging instruments at ESS and other pulse neutron sources. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the, the PSI group uh, showed very nice work um, making thin um, Gadox scintillators. Uh, and uh, in order to, for us to make use of those thin scintillators, um, you know, from the, the Nyquist, the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem, your best spatial resolution uh, is basically twice your pixel pitch. Uh, and if your camera has a pixel pitch of something like six microns, uh, your spatial resolution is going to be limited to 12. So we need to magnify the scintillation light uh, in order to uh, get around that. And so, um, my colleagues at HCB uh, created, you know, published this paper on uh, the macroscope where you have an objective lens uh, viewing the scintillator uh, and then your ocular lens um, uh, forming the image back at the detector. Um, and so this is just a very simple way of realizing that macroscope. Uh, it's not the most efficient in terms of light collection, but it's uh, simple in terms of components uh, that you can easily still get. Um, and so we're just showing here uh, the uh, spatial resolution that we're getting at uh, uh, 63 line pairs or um, about seven microns uh, at uh, different um, pixel pitches of the camera. And so we're getting pretty good um, resolution uh, for, you know, pixel pitches, something like three, 3.25. So uh, that is a convenient way of improving our spatial resolution so another thing you can do with your macroscope is then um, put an image intensifier uh, in the whole mix. So it, it becomes a rather more complicated detector. Uh, so now um, after this ocular lens, you put in your um, intensifier. Uh, and what you realize is if you take very short exposures, uh, you actually can um, resolve individual neutron capture events shown here as these little white dots. Um, if you zoom in on one of these uh, events, you can see that there's some kind of peak structure. Um, and so because of that, you can um, do a center of mass calculation. And so from the center of mass calculation, you would think you'd be able to improve your spatial resolution um, by something like root number. Spatial resolution would be improved by the, the square root of the number of photons that you're able to collect. Um, so if you form an image 
just by thresholding. So if you take a, a series of these frames like A, uh, where I've just blacked out all of the signal that's less than a certain threshold and add them up together, uh, you get this image here shown in, in uh, C. Um, if instead you do the um, center of mass calculation, um, you get image D. And then if you look at one of these regions here, which is a uh, you know gold <clears throat> gold coated uh, aluminum uh, channel, so it's been pretty well machined. Uh, you have something like a one and a half micron um, spatial resolution from the fit to the edge. One of the limitations of this is that uh, our cameras are fairly slow. Um, so our maximum frame rate uh, is something like 100 hertz. Uh, and so if you're only taking a three millisecond exposure, your dead time is something like 85%, which is not um, particularly efficient use of uh, your neutron source. And so it takes um, something along the order of four hours or longer to get this image, uh, and that's pretty challenging for a, to do much of a, a, a neutron imaging study of fuel cells or any other um, object. So as uh, cameras continue to improve, particularly the high frame rate cameras, uh, this might become more uh, convenient for, for reactor sources. And if the speeds are, uh, do actually get sufficient, they might actually be useful um, for pulse sources. But one of the problems with, as I mentioned, alluded to earlier with neutron sources is that they're weak in terms of the number of neutrons per square centimeter per second. Um, and so we have to think first about how, what, what the geometry of our conventional neutron imaging instruments are, and it's, it's a pinhole camera. So you poke a hole, in my case, in a reactor, uh, and then you let the neutrons diffuse away from the reactor source. Um, you place your object in that beam uh, and some distance from your detector and you measure the neutron shadow, so the, the loss of neutrons at your detector. In an ideal world, uh, that object looks like a nice sharp disk, um, but in the real world, there is blur just from geometry. Um, so we call this, we refer to this as our geometric unsharpness, um, which essentially goes as the distance of the object from this detector um, uh, times the aperture size over the, the separation. So you might just think, well, we can improve our geometric unsharpness by making smaller and smaller apertures. Um, however, one has to remember that the flux goes as the square of the aperture size over the uh, distance to that aperture. So smaller apertures mean much longer exposure times. Um, and so, you know, just as a, you know, rule of thumb, you know, for typical, well, this D over L is a, the inverse of the collimation ratio. And so for typical collimation ratios of about 600, which you'd use for high resolution imaging, your flux is about um, 10 to the six per square centimeter per second. And quick calculation, in a one micron pixel, there's only one neutron every hundred seconds. Uh, and so that places the very strong demand on long exposure times. If only we had a lens. There are problems with that, though. Uh, so, because a lens would allow us to completely redo our uh, geometry of our imaging instruments and make it more like a camera or a microscope, which are functional. Um, problem with uh, lenses for neutrons, you know, the refractive index differs from one by part per million and it's strongly chromatic. So, any uh, use of a polychromatic beam would result in a very uh, fuzzy image. Um, also, because neutrons are neutral and neutron beams are large, it's difficult to make use of many of the electron and X-ray focusing tricks. Um, our colleagues at uh, uh, NASA uh, Marshall Space Flight Center um, realized that they could expand their world into to the neutron world um, by taking the um, concept of the Walter optics uh, and bringing it to, to neutrons. So um, X-rays uh, have a similar, well, uh, uh, <clears throat> X-ray astronomy has a similar problem for, for neutron work in that they can't really focus the X-rays in a convenient way, and they're trying to uh, form images of, of distant and high-energy X-ray sources. Um, and so what was realized by uh, Hans Walter in um, the early 1950s is that um, by making use of uh, two conic sections 
um, you could make a microscope or a, a telescope. So this would be um, a, a lens uh, for a, a reflection based lens. Um, and so the way these optics work, uh, so you have conic sections, that's a, a parabola, hyperbola, or an ellipse. Um, and what I'm showing in this case here, in this little diagram, uh, is a hyperbolic section and an elliptical section. So you have um, rays coming from the right to the left, uh, going through your, your sample, and they're divergent. And so when they pass through the sample and hit the, the mirror surface of the hyperbolic section surface of the mirror, they appear that they're coming from this virtual focus of the hyperbola, which, uh, isn't, uh, which is now, I should say, confocal with the elliptical section. And so when the ray reflects from this hyperbolic section, it hits this elliptical section. It looks like it has come from uh, the focus of the ellipse, and so it is now redirected to the focus of the ellipse downstream where you place your detector. One of the more famous versions of this Walter optic um, uh, is, is uh, the Chandra uh, telescope. Um, with telescopes, you have the first section being a parabola, uh, so that its focus is at infinity, you know, where you want to look at the stars. Uh, and then the hyperbolic section here uh, reduces the focal length to something like a few to a meter or so. Uh, and so the figure error of the Chandra telescope is something like um, half a micro radian, and it's the, the most accurate um, Walter optic in, um, in service. The problem with Chandra is that um, it's the, the, the mirrors are two centimeter substrates with then a written iridium coating on the interior surface. So that two centimeters um, occupies a lot of space and weight, uh, which isn't used for actually focusing. And so since it costs a lot of money to um, bring things into space, uh, NASA has a project to try and create uh, mirrors that are supported on uh, metal foils. Uh, and so don't require this very thick substrate to still have, but still have high figure error. Um, or, or good figure, error, I should say. And so the uh, group at Marshall Space Flight Center has been working on creating these nickel foil mirrors. Um, uh, so the, the mirrors themselves are something like a millimeter in thickness. Uh, and then you can see that you can nest many of these mirrors together uh, to form a single lens. So what we want to do uh, for, for our Walter Optics project here is that we need to have a figure error that's at least one arc second, so that's five microradians, uh, in order to have good spatial resolution. This will improve our flux, we think, um, and we want to have a spatial resolution that's on the order of, of three microns um, as a good target. Because this is reflection-based, um, it's achromatic, so we can use this in a polychromatic beam uh, and have our focus at the same position. Um, and then an important aspect of this is that we're going to have about a meter of space between our lens and our sample and uh, certainly between our detector. And so what this allows us to do is we boost our intensity and our resolution um, and improve flexibility. I should also say um, that you get magnification um, from this uh, uh, setup from the ratio of the object to um, uh, image lengths, or I should say the inverse of that. Um, so this was our first demonstration um, done in, in 2012 and 2013, where we took a pinhole uh, grid of uh, 100 micron um, diameter pinholes in a gadolinium foil on 200 micron centers. Uh, we placed it here inside this lithiated plastic shielding. Um, there's our prototype Walter optic, which is shown here. So in this case, the prototype optic had uh, mirror diameters that were on the order of uh, three centimeters, a total length of about six centimeters, and there are three mirrors nested in this. Um, the object focal length is about uh, 60 centimeters, and then the image focal length is about two and a half meters. Um, and so this is the uh, contact image of that pinhole grid, and then this is the um, magnified image of that pinhole grid. And so you can see we can actually resolve the uh, the holes uh, where we weren't able to do that with the this setup of the um, detector. So just to 
again um, mention this one of the nice features of this is that in conventional neutron imaging in order to realize the best spatial resolution you need to have your object right up close to your detector um, and in case of the fuel cell community uh, we go to great lengths to try and make that happen so we spend a lot of time um, on the geometry and how we bring in our plumbing and, and, and all of this and it makes it for a little bit difficult job uh, to, to get all of that done um, with you know a meter of space between the the object and any optical system that becomes much more simple um, so with that uh, uh, I should say with this image here we were able to get um, funding from the from NIST uh, to start this project back in 2013 um, or 2014 uh, and midway through the project uh, we hit a little bump um, unfortunately um, our colleague at NASA uh, Misha Gubarev uh, passed away from throat cancer um, and also right around that time the Trump administration um, put on a hiring freeze uh, and our colleagues at, NASA, at Marshall Space Flight Center uh, received, uh, were awarded a large telescope project. Uh, and so all of those things put on a pretty strong crunch on uh, manpower. Uh, and so we were strongly delayed. However, uh, while this was, you know, so at this time, um, I was actually in Germany um, visiting uh, both Michael and Marcus. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, the nice experiment uh, we were able to do. Um, and so, uh, Michael was working with a graduate student, Pau Jorba, um, on um, quantum magnets. Uh, and so here uh, you would uh, uh, have a, a semi-metal turn into a ferromagnet um, as a function of pressure and uh, temperature. Uh, and you could suppress the transition temperature by increasing the pressure uh, that the, the sample was under. They were analyzing this by looking at the this so uh, it's cryogenic uh, and uh, you know in a clamp cell so many kilobars of pressure uh, and it was difficult to get the good measurements of the transition temperature and conventional um, property measurement uh, tools so they were using the depolarization imaging or just actually measuring the depolarization through the sample uh, and uh, I propose that what we do instead is that we bring um, a Walter optic uh, and image the sample uh, with the Walter optic and actually see what was going on. So the conventional way of, of doing the analysis is that there was a polarizer, uh, a sample, the spin analyzer, which is a helium three, um, a polarized helium three, and then a detector. Uh, the fact that you have this analyzer that uh, is in a magnetic field of something like half a meter uh, puts a lot of uh, introduces a lot of image blur into the conventional technique. Uh, and with our Walter optic, uh, we were able to actually arrange that the focus the samples at the focus of the optic, and we were able to uh, accommodate um, the the helium three uh, spin analyzer and its um, uh, holding field. So. This is what the uh, just a shot of what the sample looked like in the conventional image. Um, and then here's our region of interest that we're actually trying to focus in on. And then um, that's our sample there. Uh, so it's about a millimeter in size that we're gonna be focusing on. Um, and so again, here's just the cartoon of the setup. Uh, we start with our polarizing super mirror up here. Uh, we have our spin flipper uh, along this, here, we realized that we needed to put a parabolic focusing guide in to improve uh, the flux collection at the, the Walter optic um, because we were too collimated for the optic. Uh, and this was a very uh, fortuitous need, and I'll explain why in just a second. Um, and so after the, the focusing guide was our sample inside the cryostats, inside the clamp cell, uh, the spin analyzer was in this position here, but we're not showing it so that we could see the other components. There's the prototype optic that we use, and then downstream here is the detector. Um, and then this is just a movie of the depolarization versus temperature that we were able to see for one of the applied pressures. Oops, I went too fast. Um, and then here are the, the results that we reported in the uh, article here. 
um, for 15 and 11 kilobar pressure. Uh, and so you can see very clearly that we were able to map out both the critical temperature and the deviation in the critical temperature. Um, we don't believe that the deviation here is due to any chemistry, but we think it, there's just a, a um, deviations due to local pressure. We were, they repeated the measurement without the optic uh, at no applied pressure and with the standard imaging system. Um, and so you can see the uh, much higher blur that we were able, that, that they suffer um, due to the geometric blur. Uh, and so we had something like a factor of 10 improvement in spatial resolution and a factor of two improvement in time resolution. So as I mentioned, we needed this um, uh, focusing guide to improve our time resolution. Uh, and so what we did to prove, to, to understand what was going on here um, is we took images of the uh, intensity after the focusing guide with, by translating the focusing guide with respect to the Walter optic focus. And we could see that we could, we were imaging the intensity pattern uh, at the focal plane of, of the optic. Uh, and so um, we were able to match that with what we expected the intensity pattern from ray tracing uh, coming out of the focusing guide. Uh, and so this uh, indicated to me that what we could do is, um, ah, sorry, realize a, a Hooke's microscope. Um, and so uh, what we have is a condensing lens, uh, the sample, and then the objective lens. Um, and so uh, what we want to do is now, well, so what we've done is uh, design an optical system um, uh, that varied the, the parameters of the condenser uh, and the objective and their relative positions to the guide uh, to create an optical system. So the way we're doing that, um, so just to go back to how NASA creates these mirrors. Um, so first they accurately machine an aluminum mandrel. Uh, they do um, <coughs> diamond turning on that mandrel, uh, making sure that it's uh, well polished and smooth. Um, and then they do an electroplating step. Uh, with the, they electroform the mirrors. Uh, and then in an ice bath, uh, separate the electroformed mirror from the aluminum substrate. Uh, and so they're able to realize the, the figure error of the mandrel in the mirror in that ice bath, ice, ice bath separation. Um, and so at the moment, we expect an overall figure error of, this, of these nested shells of something like 10 microradians. Um, it's expected, I should say, this is not correct. Um, it's expected that in the future, they'll be able to reach a, a figure error of something like one microradian. Um, and what's nice about this overall process is that the mandrel can be reused many times. So it's just uh, the, the primary cost is in these first steps, uh, steps one through five. Uh, steps seven and eight can happen uh, many, many times. Um, there is work in progress at the Smithsonian, at the Harvard Smithsonian Institute to uh, introduce multi-layers into this process as well to extend the range um, for X-ray energies and as well for include, you know, would also work at uh, more thermal neutron energies. Um, so one of the uh, constraints that we had to consider here is that figure error of 10 microradians. Um, and that limits our focal length uh, to something like 75 centimeters so that we can have our three micron spatial resolution. Um, one of the other constraints that we had is uh, our, the optic length to reduce our field curvature. Uh, so in early simulation results, um, what we realized is that, you know, the, the focal surface is not a plane, it's a curve. Uh, and so that strength of the curve we're just showing here is a function of mirror radius for a fixed length or uh, for mirror length for a fixed radius. Uh, and what we see is that the curvature goes um, as the length of the optic divided by root R. So um, you want smaller curvature, so you want short mirrors that are fat. Um, and so uh, obviously short mirrors have reduced collection efficiency. Uh, and um, as well, if you have to be close to the focal, uh, uh, to the object, uh, you can only have so much divergence in your beam, uh, and so you can only make them so large. Um, you can also make them only so small because of the limits of the fabrication process. Uh, so the minimum um, radius that we could have is uh, uh, 20 millimeters. Um, just to give a flavor of the ray tracing results that we had, um, 
one just this figure here is just showing the need that to to optimize um, both system parameters at the same time. You can't just optimize the the um, condenser uh, to increase the flux on the sample without understanding how the objective optic is going to focus that uh, intensity back at the detector. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that uh, for varying focal lengths of the condenser, uh, we can focus, you know, something like 12, 13% of our uh, flux from the entire guide uh, onto the sample. However, <clears throat> the condenser, op the, the objective optic is inefficient at focusing all of those neutrons back at the detector. So our optimal focal length for our condenser is actually something like a meter. Um, and then as well, studying the um, mirror shells, which are sort of active uh, in the objective um, lens uh, as you know, to, to form our image. Um, we only had money for, for five shells. Uh, and so we had to cover, you know, the, uh, as much of the intensity coming from the objective as we could. Uh, and so this is just showing how that process was, was done. Um, and shell number here, instead of radius, I apologize, uh, because the length of the shells was changed, the radius varied as well. Um, but basically this goes from small radius to large radius. Uh, and this is uh, 20 millimeters up to something like 45. So this is the final uh, answer that I came up with. Um, and so this object here is the condenser profile. So it starts as a parabola and then a, a hyperbolic. Uh, there's a aperture mask here with a 25 millimeter opening. Um, that's something like five centimeters downstream from the focus of the condenser optic to have a more uniform uh, field of view over the sample. Uh, and then our objective optic here is composed of five shells, and then the detector position is some um, seven and a half meters downstream. I should say uh, we're going to collect 0.6% of the flux coming from a six by 10 centimeter guide section. Uh, eight, I, I apologize, eight um, centimeter height. Uh, and that represents a factor of uh, uh, 10,000 increase over what we would have from a pinhole optics um, setup, you, achieving the same uh, spatial resolution for the same instrument length. Um, and so with that gain um, in intensity, uh, one of the metrics that we use is how long it takes us to measure a certain thickness of water. And so what our uh, uncertainty is for, for measuring water. And our amorphous silicon detector, which we've used for a long time, is shown here in blue uh, with a spatial resolution of 250 microns. Um, and with this Walter Optic system here that we have, uh, we will have a shorter measurement time uh, for the same uh, water uncertainty thickness. So. I think what this means for, for our users is we'll be able to have uh, three micron resolution tomography. So in 3D uh, with acquisition times on the order of a few minutes. Uh, whereas it, at the moment, um, it takes about a day to get such a, such a measurement. Um, as well, we'll be able to do these measurements inside uh, bulky sample environments for furnaces, cryostats, magnets, uh, pressure rigs. Um, so we'll open up our uh, range of applications. Um, and as well, we'll just, uh, if, if we see, we can also um, introduce a velocity selector uh, so that we limit the range of the um, uh, energy range that we're using to improve our quantitation. Um, and so this will be installed at uh, the upgraded cold neutron imaging instrument. Um, so the NCNR is uh, upgrading our cold source uh, in 2023 through 2024. Um, we're taking the opportunity to upgrade a uh, few, a couple of the guides. Uh, so NG5 is going to uh, be converted and NG6 uh, is going to have an M equal to uh, super mirror with a modest curvature uh, so that we're no longer viewing the direct line of sight. Um, we'll have a, something like a factor of three increase in our neutron flux over what we have currently. Um, and so, uh, that's what I have used for doing the optimization calculations for the, the microscope. Um, so in order to do that guide upgrade work, the, um, the instrument will be dark basically from, 
for three years from November 2022 to 2025. So there's that. Uh, Thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan, for this uh, very instructive talk about uh, your projects at NIST and especially about the water optics, also covering kind of partially the, the limitations that go along with it. Um, we already have a few questions in the question and answers section, which uh, then I will just immediately start to read. Um, how many of your neutron X-ray applications truly need simultaneous neutron and X-ray systems uh, expressed percentage-wise in comparison to those applications for which an inline neutron X-ray system would provide sufficiently good results? A lot of the, the samples that we're studying are actually evolving with time. And so because of that, uh, we're, we're capturing the stochastic nature of the sample evolution. And so um, very few of our uh, applications are actually these um, samples that are of static nature. I, I would include, you know, basically fossils uh, are a, a sample that can obviously move between instruments and not really change with, with time. Um, but uh, that is, that's really the only, um, application space that that for, for that, that has been proposed to us that, that would fit in that um, everything else is uh, really demands the uh, simultaneous nature okay thanks I think that answers the question um, the next one is uh, what are the size constraints for water optics used in neutron microscopy what defines the optimum diameter and number of nests? Yeah, so the field curvature is, is, is really what's going to limit the, the sample size. Um, uh, and so I think, you know, on the order of a centimeter uh, will be the maximum uh, field of view um, in X, Y. Uh, along, there's, there's also the depth of focus that we have to consider. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, a centimeter or less. Which is good with three microns resolution, I would say. So. Yeah, it, 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 it seems to be a decent match. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question was: Did you use Maxda's model to simu uh, to model uh, the mirrors? Is there a component available in Maxda's? I assume. Um, so uh, I did all of these simulation works in collaboration with uh, Boris Hayakovich at MIT. Um, our approach to the project was that Boris had already a mixed ass uh, component, um, and I wrote uh, my ray tracing in um, MATLAB. Um, so there is a, a mixed ass component from, from Boris that exists, uh, and then there's um, uh, my MATLAB. Okay. She also has another question uh, for the thousand times new water optic mirrors. What type of diversions do you need to feed the mirrors? Um, with the, uh, condenser optic, um, the focus of the, the parabola is out at infinity. And so at some level you want a perfectly collimated beam to, to feed the, to feed that optimally. Um, but it, it basically handles whatever divergence is incoming, I would say. So um, it's this, the, the, the condenser is the, the very key feature of making, of realizing the increase in flux um, because it, it really concentrates, you know, about 10% of the guide into the sample area. Um, and then, you know, 10% of, you know, a large area and a high flux is, is helpful. Maybe, maybe I can use my priority as a moderator here to have a follow-up question. Maybe I missed it. What's the, what's the shape of the, uh, the geometric shape of the condenser? Yeah. So the first portion, it, so it's a telescope. Um, so it, it's a parabola followed by a hyperbola. Okay. And uh, the uh, length of each of the sections is 30 centimeters. And the focal length from the midpoint of their intersection to the, uh, the focus is a, a meter. Um, and then this is actually an old figure um, for a, a modified. We've had to change the guide slightly from when I, I 
created this figure. Uh, the optics will be about four and a half meters from the end of the guide. So the beam will further diverge um, and allow this, uh, the optic to, to capture more of that divergence and, and redirect. So it will actually collimate the beam a little bit more by being further away from the, the guide. Okay, thanks. The next one is, uh, what kind of gain do you expect with multi-layer coating, mostly in terms of flux? Would have also been a question I would have liked to ask, so it's a good one. Yeah, so, so, so if we had multi-layers on the condenser, uh, I think that's where I would probably want them the most. Uh, that would enable us to increase the radius of the objective. Um, and then with the increased radius of the objective, we'd have reduced field curvature. Um, that that uh, I didn't really include, I didn't do an exhaustive study on the, the M values because I knew we couldn't um, realize anything beyond um, nickel 58. Um, so that's, that's as far as I went. Um, uh, certainly in collecting more divergent beams, um, it would be, be helpful. Making this useful, you, you know, the, the, the multi-layers, even if you just use this, the, the current geometry as it was and included multi-layers, uh, you would make use of the, the shorter wavelengths um, because the optics really don't turn on until about, you know, four or five angstroms. Um, and so you're, you're, you're losing some of the spectrum. With the, the cold source upgrade and the, the curve guide at NG6, uh, there's no appreciable flux below um, three angstroms. So the fact that we don't have the, the multi-layer coating isn't going to impact us too much. Um, but certainly uh, the multi-layer coating would make, would, 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 would um, make this more applicable to a broader array of uh, spectra. Okay, thanks. Uh, next question is, most of, our, of your analysis seems to be via use of MATLAB. Are you using Python or plan to use more Python in the future? I use MATLAB. <laughs> I used to use IDL. <laughs> true. <laughs> I, you know, uh, that's a long story. I, uh, I like MATLAB because, you know, the, 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 the fact that there's a, a company making sure, doing, doing quality control, you know, even though it's still MATLAB quality, at least I, I have good, strong faith in the, um, the functions being correct and, and uh, doing as they expect. And I'm getting old and cranky. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 and that's all. Um, so I, I know there's a, the, there's obviously an interest in moving to, to Python and there's a good reason for it. Uh, um, I've just been too lazy myself to, to make the move. So. I mean, it's also sometimes good to stick to what you know and, uh, what you can handle and what you're good at. So, yeah. yeah and when you have, you know, tens of thousands of lines of code, you don't want to translate them all the time. Okay, uh, the last question that we have, uh, I think you probably already answered that, are the ray tracing images you showed done with Maxdas or MATLAB code? Uh, MATLAB. Okay, that was an easy one then. Yeah, uh, and, and, and I don't know if it's uh, it recently accelerated my, my uh, ray tracing code. Um, so that it's making use of the, the local GPU. So I can now do a one second uh, uh, experiment in four hours. Um, so what would be one second uh, exposure time, uh, I can uh, execute in four hours on my, my desktop now, which is, I'm happy with that anyway. Should be enough for an image with the water optic, right? Do maybe some of the panel members have additional questions? Or? Uh, yes, perhaps I can uh, have a quick one here. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. That was really uh, 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 very nice numbers that you showed at the end for the uh, intensity gain that we can expect. So I wonder if uh, if you also take into account in the in the optics design um, the the deformation of the of the of the optics due to gravity, which in space of course is not a problem. But if you do the deforming from the mandrel and then afterwards you need to hold it somehow, is that a, a major problem or is, is that something you can neglect? It's something that we uh, calculate through an FEA, that NASA um, calculated in an FEA process as part of their um, holder. I didn't show that. Um, 
but there, that, that, that is included in the design. Um, so uh, you can see here, uh, this is what they call a spider, um, spider mount. Um, and uh, careful consideration goes into um, the, the thickness of the mounts and how that's supported and uh, where, where the um, shells are, are, are supported and, what, and whatnot. So there is a, a consideration for that. Um, I, I apologize, I, I, I do have that somewhere uh, for, but it's for an older um, design. Um, so I don't have a, an updated uh, FEA for, for this final optical system. Okay, thanks. And about uh, stresses by multilayers. So if you incorporate multilayers in the concentric optics, uh, what do you expect? What, 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 what would happen? Is that a major problem that you need yeah, to take that into consideration? Um, I should say that that's not my work. Uh, and and uh, they are working on that uh, separation challenge and, and the stresses there. Uh, they're, the figure error that they're getting is um, on the order of uh, 30 micro radians, I think. No, 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 30 arc second. Um, that's going off my memory. Um, uh, Suzanne Romine um, at uh, uh, Harvard Smithsonian is the one who's leading that, that effort. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, you know, for, for telescopes, they use, they're, they're, they're approaching it with many different ways, you know, making small, small coupons and then gluing them all together to form the, the, the shells that way um, to, I think, address that very problem, you know, that the stresses that you're going to get from it. Um, that's not so convenient for when we want to do neutron imaging uh, and have more of a uniform and not patchy um, uh, mirror. So I would like to know then uh, how how will you deal with the field curvature? What what do you expect is the the field of view that uh, that you get a good performance in, or how how do you tackle this uh, to improve this potentially? It's a good question, um, and I don't have a good answer yet. Uh, what I'm planning to do uh, first is you know we reduce we we maintain the length of the optic at some you know max. 20, 20 overall centimeters. Um, I would have gone shorter, but we had difficulty having good um, quality mirrors when we went with shorter um, mirror sections. So one, you have to limit the, the field of view. Um, the other, uh, then there's a few other things one could do. Um, one could scan the sample position at some level. Um, the other is, you know, we're, we're trying to um, because the point spread function basically is going to be uh, varying across the field of view, um, I have a postdoc trying, you know, seeing if he can get any uh, machine learning kind of approaches to do the deep blurring process. Um, one of the, um, you know, because we can do the ray tracing, um, we can know what the initial object was and what the image was. Um, and so I'm hoping that. Um, with such data, we can train a good um, um, network to do the deep blurring for us. Um, it, you know, if, if, it, if it were just a, you know, a uniform point spread function over the field of view, then I wouldn't worry about the machine learning aspects, but because it's, because it's not uh, uh, stationary, um, I'd wanna go through, go to that approach. So that's, that's where I'm headed. Um, and if anyone has any better ideas, uh, I am all ears. Okay, we have two more questions here. Uh, can you develop on the technique used to de de deposit multi-layers inside the shells? So depositing in the in the interior of the shells is kind of a pain. And I think what they do instead, uh, just, just because of the, you know, having to change the um, uh, rods and what have you, they instead, um, deposit right onto the mandrel, and then they separate off from that way. Um, again, this is, uh, uh, I'm outside of my comfort zone um, talking about this in, in any um, in any way. Okay, and the last one, is how thick is each mirror, and is there any idea how thin you can make it? We found that a millimeter thick uh, film mirror is the what we want to use for, you know, dealing with 
the gravity effects and uh, just good separation from the, the mirrors. Um, at first we thought something like half a millimeter, um, but those, those studies showed that that was too thin. Um, going thicker, you know, would, would be okay as well. You're just slightly losing some of your uh, collection efficiency um, with the, the substrate. But then what would be the, the theoretical number of shells you could have if you had enough money to, to buy them? Well, you can see from this plot here that uh, with five shells, uh, we're basically capturing all of the neutrons that we're focusing with the condenser. Um, so if I were to make the mirror shorter, be, uh, because that problem was solved and we'd have a few more uh, nested shells in there. Um, if I was able, if we were able to have a higher, uh, uh, M, you know, super mirror coatings on the condenser and we could make this wider, maybe that would change as well. Uh, if the figure error of the objective were improved and we could have a larger distance between the sample and the objective so that we could have a larger radius, that would maybe also change things. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dan, again, for your very interesting presentation and also the very lively discussion. It was a pleasure to have you here with us. And uh, yeah, I would like to say, say goodbye to everyone and in particular to you, Dan, and uh, my colleagues from Lens uh, and hope to see you for the next webinar. <laughs>